Thank you to the organizers for this very exciting day of talks. Uh, we mostly have seen um, recent technological innovations. Today I'll be talking about innovations that are about 100 million years old. In particular, I want to talk about how animals stay dry to stay alive. Um, I'll talk about two of my, two of my most favorite animals. Um, the first is building this raft, a raft of ants. And um, the second, uh, I met when I was, first started dating my wife, who was to be my wife three years ago. And this is a, um, my wife's ex-boyfriend's Valentine's gift to her, um, <laughs> who uh, he, he and I did not get along at first. Um, and uh, he was on Good Morning America a little while ago. So we'll talk about that in the later half of the talk. Okay. So today I want to talk about how small organisms um, survive with water. And when you're very small, the forces of surface tension are important. On our scales, they're, not, they're, they're almost negligible, but as you can see here, this is the combat or mating sequence of the water strider, and it's completely on the water surface. So these animals' bodies are specifically tuned so that they're lightweight enough to support themselves on the water surface. They can somersault, jump, wrestle, that's a headlock over there, all without penetrating. And this is because their small size is allows surface tension to support their weight and all the forces they would apply. So you see from this video that surface tension resists them deforming the surface and acts like a trampoline. And we'll see how it acts to, um, uh, to keep these animals dry in a second. Now in my field, <clears throat> the Holy Grail was about 10 years ago, they discovered that lotus leaves are self-cleaning. And this is by virtue of the fact that the lotus leaf, if you look very closely, it's a very bumpy surface. And as a result, all the water sees is air. And so water beads up, pulls down impurities, and the lotus leaf stays clean. Um, over the last few years, there's been many applications of this phenomenon. You can imagine some of you are wearing Gore-Tex, um, some of you are wearing waterproof pants, where they basically have tried to change these mechanisms into successful technologies. As you know, it's still underway. Um, very few of our, our fabrics are, wa are truly water repellent. It's often very expensive and fragile. So I'll talk about mechanisms that I think might improve that. So we'll start, start with probably what you're familiar with. This is, um, these are ants. But these are ants that you probably haven't seen before. These evolved in the Pantanal of Brazil, where it's flood, the lands are flooded twice daily. And so what you're seeing here is a surface that's completely composed of ants, no glue or anything else. So over hundreds of millions of years of evolution, these ants have learned to grip each other and build um, intelligent structures. So over time, they've built rafts that are water repellent, bridges, and um, when they camp overnight, they build these bivouacs right here. Uh, these bivouacs can open and close to change the temperature um, and uh, allow the colony to survive harsh elements. Today I'll be talking about mostly the rafts. Now if you want to build something, you need a glue. And the ant's glue is literally just their teeth and their claws. They literally grip each other, um, gripping their neighbors. But because they have so many neighbors and each ant has six arms, there's quite a num large number of connections between the ants and their neighbors. As a result, they form a very tight and strong network. One reason the ants have to do this is because they have terrible wetting properties. Uh, imagine that basically you stick to water every step you make is what happened to these ants. They're, they're what people call hydrophilic. And as a result, if their swimming is like swimming through a viscous goo. But the ants have basically learned to construct new surfaces by linking their bodies at a particular spacing that water can't penetrate. This effectively increases the energetic cost of wetting by introducing air between the ants. But if you don't believe me, you can ask the ants yourselves. So this is, a, this is one of our videos. Um, it has one million hits on YouTube. <laughs> Everyone wants us to kill the ants. <laughs> As you see, that's very hard. So this is, this is a, a raft built by ants, and you see it's totally water repellent. This is completely filled with air. So we have established that by linking together this spacing, they can prevent water from penetrating. But that's not really much use unless you can do it in flash flood conditions. So how quickly can they build? So I'm gonna show you um, a sequence of videos, 
But first imagine that you're an ant. So imagine you're a student on Georgia Tech campus. You've got, we're all on a boat, and we have about 10,000 of our classmates all clamoring to be on top, clamoring to prevent from drowning and for survival. And you see you've got some people carrying their uh, laptops, wearable computers, <laughs> backpacks, people on the bottom, people on the top. It's a mess, a chaotic mess. This is what the ants do. This is a view from above. 10,000 ants, two minutes, and a raft is built. And what they do is they all are scrambling to run outwards. As they reach the edge, they're grabbed by their neighbors, and this raft builds and builds and builds. Here's another view from above with half the number of ants. And you can see there's always a few black sheep that want to <laughs> start their own colonies. But for the most part, they stick together and build this formation. Here's a view from the side. We start with a sphere of ants. Basically, you, you basically can take a, a cup and roll up a sphere of ants really easily. And you put it on the water surface, and they know instinctively to build a raft that has intrinsically two layers. A wet layer. Yeah, there's a few, few that like to walk underwater. It's not clear how to do that. <laughs> but ultimately, there are two casts on the ant raft society. There's the downtrodden, those that are wet, that must support their neighbors. This is the underclassmen. And then these are the juniors and seniors basically sit along on top, riding, riding their fellow workers. <laughs> so let's talk about how they build so quickly. Well, the time scale of the raft depends on how quickly an ant can walk. If an ant can walk twice as fast, the raft is built twice as quickly. So what does an individual ant do? If you paint an ant, this is what you see happens. You're stuck in the middle of this sphere of ants, and you want desperately to escape. So what they do is, they, they want to run, choose a random direction, run as fast as they can to get the heck out of there. They do that, and they get to the end, and they find there's no escape. So the alternative is to turn around, choose another random direction, and run as fast as hell, and keep on doing that over and over again. The only problem is, every time they get to an edge, there's a finite probability, which we can measure, that one of their neighbors grabs them. If their neighbor grabs them, they become the bottom of the raft. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> but um, basically, so we can actually calculate how long, that, how long that distance of travel is. You can't tell what every ant pr does precisely, but because there are 10,000 ants, you know on average um, what the ex expect expected travel distance is. So you can integrate across all angles to find the position from the, any point on the raft to the edge, from any point on the edge to another edge, and you get the expected travel distance. And so that's the core of this model. We can predict how, given the raft size, how long each ant has to travel. And knowing how long each ant has to travel, we can figure out exactly how many accumulate on the edge. And so with this simple model, we basically can show there are three stages of graph growth. Slow in the beginning, because there are not many ants on the top to build. Increasing in speed, um, when you have more ants on the top. And then eventually decaying in speed, which you saw in the videos as a result of basically running out of ants. And you see this slow, fast, slow behavior. And we can basically predict this nonlinear increase in raft size and show that with the, raft, with the ant walking speed, these ants can build them in about 200 seconds. There are other things I won't have time to discuss. For example, you think this would be an amoeba, but it's actually a raft of ants reaching for the surface of water. This is how they dock. Basically, one key part of, of swarm intelligence is that each ant has only local information. So this ant sees the surface and walks towards it. This whole raft changes in shape from a circle to um, a flagella. And we believe the principle we find might have, um, may have an ability to help elucidate swarm intelligence in other systems. S decreasing uh, shrinking technologies allow us to build basically these uh, modular robots, which are able to build structures. There's also cellular mechanisms that do similar things on a much smaller scale. So that's my first story. You wouldn't think mammals have much to do with surface tension, but um, here's the video. So 
Imagine you want to get dry and you have four legs. It's a lot harder than it looks. I've actually tried this on the floor of my office on all fours. <laughs> it's um, only in private. But this is very, very difficult. Um, you basically have to start a self-ringing cycle. So you've got to turn your front legs and back legs in opposite directions to get your body to twist and all at the right speed to get the drops to leave. It turns out to get the drops to leave, which I'll talk about, takes about 10 to 70 gravities of acceleration. The, the human limit is 20 gravities. They call this eyeballs out. For the, person, for the person who took a rocket sled and stopped it at 20 Gs. His eyeballs detached from his retinas. Um, and as you can see, the dog and the other animals I will show all have to keep their eyes shut to prevent their eyeballs from eyeballing out. The other great thing about this is that you can get 70% dry. We can actually weigh these animals um, uh, after they shake, and they lose 70% of their water all in a single second. Washing machines, which work on a different principle, take about 10 minutes. So why did this thing evolve? So there's this great quote from a, a very old article by Haldane on being the right size. And uh, basically, if you come out of the bathtub, you have about a layer of water that's a 50th of an inch thick. Um, and that weighs roughly a pound on your body. But as bodies get smaller, they carry more and more water. For example, a wet mouse has about its own weight of water trapped in the fur, and a fly has many times its own weight. So as a result, as these animals get smaller and smaller, getting dry is, becomes increasingly more difficult. Um, a pound of water uses an exorbitant amount of energy to evaporate. Um, a 60-pound dog would require about 20% of its daily energy just to evaporate the water in midwinter if it couldn't do this. So doing this shake is a matter of life and death for these animals. This is an example of particle tracking. This is what we do in our lab. We can take a pink straw and attach it to the top of the dog's back. And um, what you see from this video is the top of the back actually goes to the 90 degrees to the side on the right and 90 degrees on the left. It shows the skin is very loose, and that's actually very important in the shake process. The motion um, from freshman physics, it turns out to be simple harmonic motion. And it turns out the velocity of the skin is about three times the velocity of the top of the backbone. As I'll show you in this, when we talk about centripetal forces, if you have three times the velocity, you have nine times the force. And as a result, these animals um, only get a tenth as dry if they had tight skin. This is a video from Young Hee Chang's lab of a wet rat shaking in high-speed x-ray. And you can see that a backbone pretty much stays straight, um, only the uh, skin is moving back and forth. One of, the great, one of the great things about biology is that you have to have these same mechanisms work on a whole variety of length scales. So this shaking mechanism has to work um, all the way from mice uh, all the way up to bears. Let's see how that happens. This is the smallest shaker in the world, a very small mouse, and it shakes faster than the eye can see, 30 times per second. It's one of the fastest motions in the animal kingdom. As we go up a little bit bigger, this is a rat, about 20 times per second. I call this shaky bacon. This is about 10 times per second. So as we see, we see a general trend as they get larger, their shaken frequency decreases. This sheep is amazing. Uh, sheep have lanolin in the fur, so we were very surprised they had to learn to shake at all. Uh, lanolin is very water repellent. <laughs> there, it's very, very good. This is around five times per second. So now we get to more and more ferocious animals. The largest animal we looked at was the grizzly bear in the Atlanta Zoo. Well, as in we, I meant my grad student with a hose. <laughs> this is about four times per second. And the most ferocious animal of all, um, the most dangerous animal of all, is ourselves. Uh, we can only move our heads about two to three times per second. <laughs> So that just gives you an idea of how fast these animals are. So you see, over the, ra over the range of animal sizes, smaller animals tend to shake faster. 
Why is that? And the answer all has to do with freshman physics. Basically, smaller animals have a smaller radius of gyration. And as a result, they have smaller centripetal forces that they have to compensate with by having higher speed. We can break our argument into two points, basically. When you're a smaller, when you're a light, more lightweight animal, you have a smaller radius. Your mass scales your radius to some power. When you want to get rid of a drop, imagine you're a drop on the back of a dog. You've got two forces on you. The force of surface tension binding you to the animal, and the force that you supply by whipping your body back and forth. Basically, in order to maintain, generate the forces to break surface tension, which scale as drop size, you've got to shake your body at a frequency according to mass, such as this. Notice the exponent is negative, indicating that as you're bigger, you can shake at um, slower frequencies. For this simple mathematics, we come up with what Good Morning America has called the wet dog shake rule. But basically, um, using no free parameters, we can predict what shaking frequencies these animals uh, must choose to remove water. There's a wide range of masses here. It's five orders of magnitude, 10,000 difference in mass. And we can basically predict the exponential scaling coefficient of 0.22 um, with a very close um, factor. Of, we have a 0.19 that we predicted with our scaling. And one thing we find from this analysis is that this is an ancient mechanism. It's evolved about 200 million years ago, but it's ill-suited for modern times. The mechanism you showed, we showed basically relies on generating centripetal forces to, get, to fight surface tension. Water has a very high surface tension but low viscosity. But as a result, it's very poor for, for fluids that have high viscosity, like crude oil. So, so as a result, these animals, they will, they will remain, remain coated in oil if they try to shake it off, which is unfortunate. Another, another direction I think this will go in the future is, that, is towards autonomous robots. Basically, um, you might have heard about this story of the Mars rover, um, which has stopped um, in part because uh, the solar panels of this machine was, became covered in dust. So I believe in the future, autonomous robots, to be truly autonomous, they'll have to shake off um, things like water and dust. So I've showed you two mechanisms that are very different from perhaps what you've known before about water repellency. They depend on principles such as um, linking of bodies and what I call active water repellency, where they use, the use of energy is used to get rid of water droplets. The last thing I want to say is that I think these kinds of methods, um, they're useful for scientists and roboticists, but I think they also have a great impact on our youth. Um, I think showing videos and studying animals is a great way to teach physics to young audiences. With that, um, Thanks a lot.